Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Meet the Professor, as today we talk about the management of soft tissue sarcoma and related connective tissue disorders with Dr. Brian Van Tyne, the Barnes Jewish Hospital in Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, we also are doing another program with Dr. Riedel from the Duke Sarcoma Center. And for any people who have questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We have a quick one minute uh, pre and post uh, test for you to take. If you take it, you'll get a lot more out of the meeting today. Uh, we're doing another program this coming Thursday, uh, really for nurses. So all well, the nurses are here today or nurses that you know, uh, let them know that at five o'clock we'll be talking about urothelial bladder cancer. We just got back from the ONS Congress where we did nine, so, uh, 10 symposia actually. And then we'll be heading out uh, the week after uh, to the ASCO meeting as always. We'll be at the Hilton Hotel in the big ballroom there. We can start now with upper GI cancers Friday around noon. Uh, then we'll go lung cancer, hepatic biliary, a lot going on there. Prostate cancer, the Embark study. We're going to be talking about that on Saturday night, Sunday morning, ovarian cancer. Then we'll be doing our heme program with uh, CLL, myeloma, and lymphoma, bladder cancer on Monday, breast cancer, and we'll finish out on Tuesday morning uh, with uh, RCC. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars because it's convenient to do that while you're driving in your car or working out. If you're into podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series, including a recent program with Dr. Gounder on desmoid tumors, something that uh, we're going to talk about today. But we are here to talk about uh, soft tissue sarcoma. I was uh, joking with Dr. Van Tyne. It's been a while since we uh, talked about this because we tend, tend to talk about things when stuff's happening. And fortunately, things are starting to happen in sarcomas, as we're going to talk about. We're going to really feature a couple of new approaches in uh, these diseases that we're going to talk about today. As always, uh, we have uh, some docs who are going to be presenting cases. Uh, actually, Dr. Bowie is an uh, investigator at uh, Stanford. Uh, he has one case, and at our next program, he's going to present a bunch of other cases. And then we actually have two general medical oncologists who will present in soft tissue uh, sarcoma cases, but they're interesting people, as you're going to see and hear. Uh, Dr. Hussein started out at uh, Duke also. He came down to South Florida, now is a general medical oncologist, but he has an interest in sarcoma, sees a lot of patients in the South Florida area. And Dr. Melanie Thomas, who we actually interacted with about 20 years ago when she was an investigator in MD Anderson, believe it or not, uh, Brian, she focused on HCC. We did a round table that she was part of, and then she decided she was going to be a general medical <laughs> oncologist. So she's now in the Duke network and uh, three times a week uh, takes a two hour drive into rural North Carolina and dives into general medical oncology. So we're going to start out with a, some of the new things going on in the field. Uh, particularly immunotherapy, which is, of course, so uh, important in general in oncology today, but also some really interesting things that have happened in desmoid tumors. Talk a little bit about targeted therapy, and then we'll jump into some of the more common sarcomas that people see in the community. But, Brian, I just want to sort of put things in perspective. We were doing, I was doing a video the other day with Dr. Srinivas, where our, well, I mentioned we are doing this prostate cancer program, and she said something to me, and I said, I got to I got to tell somebody that you said this, which was back in the day in 2019. Uh, that's how she began uh, the comment. And uh, I kind of feel like that's the way it is in oncology today, Brian. And I'm so happy that things are starting to happen uh, in uh, sarcomas. Can you kind of put a little bit in perspective where we are today compared to even five years ago? And what are some of the big trends you see happening? I actually, I'd like to start with putting my field into perspective 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we had three lines of therapy in hospice. We had doxorubicin with or without ifosfamide. We had gemcitabine given with docetaxel. We had the carbazine and we had clinical trial. 
Now, if you open up the NCCN guidelines for the treatment of sarcoma, it becomes this very complex group of diseases with different drugs for different sarcomas. And it's actually gotten wonderfully complexly complicated based on clinical trial data, which was something that, you know, when I first entered the field, I was worried we'd never do a phase three trial. And now we're looking at, you know, uh, lots of different approvals with different drugs for different indications and with many, many more to come. And we're even now developing, you know, T-cell therapies for solid tumors, especially synovial sarcoma, which I think is something I would have never thought of 10 years ago. Yeah, we'll get into the issue of uh, immunotherapy, particularly uh, checkpoint inhibitors. I was wondering if that was ever going to happen. You know, one of the challenges is because of the, the rare, not only the rarity of these tumors, um, but also the fact that the, the classification scene at least seems complicated to most docs, I think, really hard to sort of wade into that. I was curious about this uh, partnership that you put together, uh, the Midwest Sarcoma Trials uh, Partnership, what that is, and also what your perspective is on, you know, how the care that these patients receive. It seems like at, at least the patients should maybe have their case run by a sarcoma investigator at a minimum, almost without fail. What's your perspective in terms of, you know, who are the patients that really need to be pulled out and have some kind of investigator input? You know, I, I, for the personal bias, I think all sarcoma patients should go through a multidisciplinary tumor board uh, and, a, and a high volume practice that sees a large volume of sarcoma, at least at the beginning. You know, the first thing you need to make sure you do is have actually the correct pathology. You know, we, there are publications showing that your pathology may not be absolutely correct about 25% of the time. And sometimes we're, you know, amelanotic melanomas sneak through and they're called sarcoma. And then there's a lot of nuances to that are in the, within the 175 different kinds of sarcomas that we actually have with a name now. You know, 10 years ago, you know, there were a whole series of very junior people, uh, you know, that worked in the Midwest. It was Mark Gulnick at, you know, Northwestern and Mo Milhelm at Iowa, Scott Acuna, uh, you know, at uh, Mayo. And we all came together and, uh, you know, because we had this kind of Midwestern collegiality formed up a, a trials partnership. And what's interesting is that, you know, the Mayo system comes with, you know, satellites that are in Phoenix and they're in, uh, uh, Jacksonville, and there's a whole series of community practices attached to, you know, Washington University in St. Louis. And, you know, even uh, when Mark moved to City of Hope, we, we, we expanded there and we have these networks now of central hubs with community support where we're going back and forth, not only with trial opportunities, but with expertise uh, that really does support Port, you know, the Midwestern patient group. And now uh, we've moved LA to the Midwest and have really incorporated that into our, our trials partnership, getting new access for new drugs to sarcoma patients. So, yeah, I think the last time we worked together, there's the Oloratumab was uh, this topic, so to speak, and that sort of went away. And now it looks like a whole bunch of new data is out there. This uh, audience are the, are the orals uh, for uh, uh, the sarcoma session at the ASCO, and these are all uh, checkpoint trials. They're all immunotherapy. The one at the bottom that has an LBA uh, is actually Dr. Van Tynes. He won't tell me, but this is uh, CABO plus Ipinevo, kind of similar to what we've seen in uh, renal with the cosmic, uh, uh, one of the cosmic trials. Uh, but a bunch of other strategies there, trabectinib plus nivolumab. Where have we been? It seems like, you know, there are a bunch of solid tumors that kind of, you know, prostate, we don't see much checkpoint inhibitors, breast, just in you know, triple negative, uh, colon, just MSI high, except upper GI we see a lot. Where were we, you know, a couple of years ago with immunotherapy, uh, Brian, and where do you think we're heading? Well, I think there were two groundbreaking trials that happened a little while back. The first was called SARC-28. And what SARC-28 did was take 10 patients each in about five different soft tissue sarcoma histologies and then three different bone histologies and really asked the question, is there activity of Pembro? 
And the first thing that begins to jump out from the initial trial is that uh, Pembro seems to have activity in, say, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but not necessarily lyomyosarcoma, and nothing within Ewing's, et cetera. But this was our very first taste. And right after that, the Alliance comes in with Nevo and in a non-comparator arm, Ipinevo. Uh, and looked at activity across soft tissue sarcoma without any selection for a subtype. And there's really interesting signals there where you see early responses in what turned out to be some MSI high patients. You see, you know, uh, patients with the UPS and the disease go away. And then, but because we were non comparator, we weren't sure which one was the best. And so since then, there's been trials of TKIs with, say, Nevo or Pembro. And then a lot of these trials have now come into fruition to which the oral session this year is excitingly dominated by immunotherapy trials, asking whether we should be giving chemo with immunotherapy, asking if we should be giving things like cabozantinib with immunotherapy. And what I'm excited about, and maybe just my bias, what I'm actually presenting is the first randomized trial of cabo epinevo versus cabo, which is actually comparator, so that we can begin to see if there are signals where it may not just be, say, the TKI or the immunotherapy, uh, that we may see if the actual combinations are reading out a superior. You know, unlike the, you know, melanoma data that was just presented for this plastic melanoma at AACR, where everybody had almost a complete response, we don't see those kind of signals in sarcoma. And so because of that, really figuring out where to put what combination is of where I think our field is at. And that really is explained, I think, by what you're seeing in the orals this year. So, of course, now, we, as I mentioned, in December, we saw the approval of tezolizumab and alveolar soft part sarcoma. Kind of tough to find cases of those. It's like 1% of sarcoma. But amazingly, Dr. Bowie had two cases for us. So why don't we jump into the first one? This is a really an interesting case of a younger patient, 34 years old. Uh, here's the story. 34-year-old man presented in clinic with a slow-growing right shoulder mass over the past year. Because he was young, he was told it was a lipoma and eventually had a non-oncologic base excision. It turned out to be alveolar soft sarcoma and the tumor ended up recurring in a 7.1 centimeter mass. And a CT staging scan unfortunately showed widespread lung metastases. A biopsy at that time also showed ASPS. He was actually started on immunotherapy with ipilimumab and nivolumab. After just one cycle of immunotherapy, he had tachycardia, shorts of breath, and was admitted to the hospital for thyroid storm. A CT scan on admission showed a slight increase in tumor size, which was concerning for progression, but could also possibly be pseudoprogression on immunotherapy. He was started on propranolol for a thyroid storm, and he was continued on ipilimumab and nivolumab. He went into complete remission after a few cycles, and he's now off of nivolumab for the past one and a half years with no evidence of disease. What are the questions you think would be interesting to have Dr. Van Tyne discuss about this case? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the scans, the second scan was definitely increased in size from the first scan. So the question I think would be like, at this point, the scans show that the tumors have increased in size. Do you stop immunotherapy now, which is something like a VEGF TKI? Do you continue with immunotherapy? And also, what are the risks of continuing on immunotherapy if this patient had thyroid storm? He's been off immunotherapy for a year and a half with no evidence of recurrence. When can you discontinue immunotherapy for these patients? And for him, he had to discontinue because he, he got a lot of skin toxicity. So we just rolled the dice and said, let's just discontinue it. And he's been in remission. So, wow, a lot there. Um, you know, we haven't talked about pseudoprogression since uh, IOs came out. In the beginning, we were talking about that all the time. Then I haven't heard too much about it. But uh, first, uh, any comments about that? It did look like it was increasing. I, you know, I guess people always debated whether this is just the tumor hasn't really gotten started to respond yet or maybe somehow getting stimulated. Have you ever seen that happen? I have experienced for a fact that pseudoregression does happen in sarcoma. And, you know, looking very early on, I, I don't know if that's pseudoprogression or just tumor progression. Uh, you know, it, it really is kind of a hard thing to do when three weeks into a scan, unless you really know your rate of growth going in. But, you know, my bias is always based, I, I guess because I've been involved in all the protocols, is always to treat past it to give the patient the benefit of the doubt, especially if they... uh especially if there are no great other options. And, you know, that's 
where ASPS gets really complicated. There are, you know, for a tumor that has an incidence of somewhere between 20 and 40 patients in America a year, we know a lot about this disease. And <laughs> I think it's because of the NCI. The NCI has been devoted to this disease for, you know, generations. And, you know, they were the first to figure out that TKIs actually could stabilize this disease for a very long time. You know, next comes along Breland Wilkie, where she does a trial with Exitinib and Pembro. And the the real signal in her sarcoma trial were all her ASPS patients because she had a national reputation. And because of that, people would go to see her. In parallel, we had all seen, you know, within the other trials, Ipinevo having an effect. And then Alice Chen, who's at the NCI, comes along with what I think is the nicest therapy here, right, which is otezolizumab. Uh, which from a side effect profile and now with an FDA approval, uh, but based on side effects alone has actually become my preferred frontline therapy for this. And so, you know, what's interesting in this case, and there, I'm not questioning whether Ipinevo was appropriate. That I, That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think you may have actually gotten the same effect with the tazolizumab alone without the potential thyroid storm caused by the ipilimumab. Uh, but I think that all this data is just come out within the last year. And so I think that, you know, at least we now have prospective clinical trial data that's beginning to inform us on what to do. Yeah, so, I mean, this situation comes up. You know, sometimes people use Ipinevo and MSI high disease, and they get all excited, and then people go, well, you know, use Pembro alone. You're going to see the same thing, but with less uh, toxicity. This is actually, I should have mentioned, was part of a clinical trial that the patient got uh, treated that way. What about the thyroid storm? I mean, I've heard like a thousand cases of hypothyroidism, a bunch of hyperthyroidism, but thyroid storm, have you ever seen that? Has it been reported? That, that I have not personally seen, and I give a lot of epinevo. Uh, you know, I did have a case of an elk negative immunofibroblastic, immunomyofibroblastic tumor that I did the same thing to. And these quick extreme responders in sarcoma may have extreme side effects. And so there may be something to this. I do know, just based on personal experience, that, and it may be a property of mesenchymal tissue, uh, where the side effects from, uh, sarcoma and immunotherapy have a prevalence for endocrinopathies. Uh, you know, adrenal insufficiency, you know, hypothyroidism most commonly, uh, you know, you know, type 1 diabetes, all, you know, all of these kind of endocrinopathies as opposed to pneumonitis or colitis in my experience. And so that thyroid storm is probably within the spectrum of the weirdness we get when we start to treat a mesenchymal tissue. <laughs> So Hassan in the chat room asks the question that comes up a lot. Is there a correlation with autoimmune toxicity in response to treatment? This patient had a very dramatic autoimmune problem, had a great response. There's been a lot of literature looking at that. Recently, I'm starting to see stuff about certain types of autoimmune toxicity, maybe more you know, correlated with a benefit. What's your take on that whole thing? That would be my gut feeling, but we have no real, we don't have a large volume of data to substantiate that. I think it's something that at least in our field, we need to look at more closely. But I, I agree with you that uh, it feels right, especially with the patients where uh, I get extreme responses and quick extreme responses. They seem to have uh, an autoimmune flare at the same time. So here's the FDA approval that came out in December for Tezo. I'm kind of curious, um, what is it about uh, this particular sarcoma that they s seem to respond to IOs. I don't think they have PD-1 or high TMB. Any speculation? You know, I, I do have a speculation. So alveolar soft part sarcoma is driven by a translocation between the ASPS1 locus and, you know, TFE3. And that's not the interesting part. It forms a crystalline structure within the cytoplasm of the MCT1 transporter. And so there may be uh, just a shape that's there that makes it much more immunogenic. I mean, literally, you can if you go and look at like a, uh, uh, you know, electron micrographs or even some light microscopy of ASPS, it's a very unique looking tumor. 
And it's got this large crystalline structure, these transporters. And so there may be something within the transporter biology that makes it different. We don't know, but it is a, it's a fascinating disease, right? And so when you get into a trial that, you know, for full disclosure, I was involved in, uh, you know, this was a uh, trial where we didn't think we'd see a lot of patients, and then we did because we had the trial. And the response rate and the durability of this trial has been, you know, I've had people on this trial still getting their otezolizumab. And the trial went on so long that what uh, they've actually added a crossover to the addition of Avastin at progression. And I'm waiting to see how that data reads out because, you know, Avastin with otezolizumab is also much better, in my opinion, than adding a TKI from a side effect standpoint. And so, you know, we may have a second line therapy evolving with Avastin, depending on how the data reads out, which is all monoclonal based. And so if that can happen, I think we can continue to provide, you know, really kind of what I consider transformative therapy compared to when I started, uh, where, you know, some of the early TKIs were shown to have effects. Uh, now we have, you know, these durable, you know, remissions and partial responses that go on for years. And with a therapy so, that, you know, as we use Altezolizumab, that's really well tolerated. So, yeah, here's, uh, you were talking about with a Bevacizumab. You know, I get like mm -hmm. an allergic reaction when people say trade names. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, sorry. But anyhow, <laughs> that's <Hi>. okay. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it ties also into it ties into your paper with Cabo and IO too. Same, mm -hmm. I mean, a similar principle. Of, you know, again, renal, for example, another where you see a lot of uh, anti-angiogenics uh, plus IO. Um, and you wrote this paper, and anything you want to summarize about why you don't see this kind of thing in other sarcomas. You know, there's a lot of cold sarcomas, and, you know, we're home to a lot of translocations. And so, you know, when you have a low TMB and a translocation and you're PD-1 negative, and you start looking at Ewing's and Synovial and some of the more common translocation-driven sarcomas, we're kind of at an, like an IO loss. And so, and especially since we're a tumor at home in our own mesenchymal microenvironment, you know, looking different than self may be hard. And so we have all sorts of ways to go about this. But, you know, I think that uh, the, the you can see from the investigators around the world that, you know, we are not giving up on trying to actually make immunotherapy work better. Uh, but I still think our, our stellar home, our home run right now is going to be the, you know, the T-sphere to MJ4 within synovial sarcoma. Uh, that to me is one of the better home runs of my uh, my career where we get a single treatment and patients that are now out past three years uh, just with a, you know, a T-cell treatment, which is really exciting in terms of solid tumors. But when you really get into the average sarcoma, you know, whether we're looking at, you know, effector T-cells or oncolytic viruses or sensitizers to make IO work better, uh, I think that it's hard when you have many types of sarcomas and these are still the trials we're doing except for the presentation before mine is only an angiosarcoma trial. And in that, uh, you know, the Alliance has actually looked at the combination of Cabo with Nevo alone in angiosarcoma. Uh, but that's also because angi cutaneous angiosarcoma has the same UV signature as melanoma. And so they're trying to figure out the so right stimulant there. So this thing with synovial cell, this is car, like CAR T. Oh, it's a it's a spear T. It's a it's a modified T cell. So we still have to modify it to go after MJ four. It's HLAO two restricted. And then uh, what about the question? Uh, and here's a, another. This is a poster that's going to be presented. Ask us. We'll see all these uh, abstracts in a couple of days. And dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma. Uh, but what about his, uh, the question uh, Dr. Bowie brought up? And we, this, you hear this question come up with MSI high, you hear it in lung cancer, which is when do you stop an IO and a patient is responding and at this point doing well? Uh, how do you approach it? What's done in the trials? Cell-free DNA has been looked at to try to help make that decision. Any thoughts? 
Uh, I would love to have cell-free DNA uh, really helping guide that decision embedded within some of our trials. I think that'll make our next gen. Uh, that'll be within our next generation of trials. You know, I think what we're doing as a field is more paralleling what the melanoma doctors do now, which is to treat for two years and then see what happens, right? Because after two years of therapy, except for the extreme responders where it becomes a little bit harder, I usually go a year. Uh, you know, you have two years of therapy and then the immune system done what the immune system is going to do. And, you know, is this a, at what point are we just giving drugs that no longer matter? I don't think we have that data yet, but uh, you know, if you ask where I make my decisions, they're extrapolated from melanoma. Yeah, we hear that a lot in solid tumors, a two-year point. And I think it's good, too, if you tell the patient that up front, and then maybe it's a little bit more acceptable when they get to that point. All right, well, let's talk about desmoid tumors. My eyes were way wide open at last asthma meeting last fall, a presidential uh, presentation uh, related to desmoid tumors and nirogasistat, which we're going to talk about. Uh, and so we have a couple of cases of uh, desmoid from uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, beginning with a woman in her mid-30s with a small desmoid tumor, just three centimeters on the abdominal wall. Here's what happened. Young lady presented with abdominal wall, three to four centimeter, and she was in her thirties. And I told her about serapinib. She didn't like it. She didn't like anti-estrogen, tamoxifen. She said, really? You want to put me in menopause at 30 something? And she said, I'm not really convinced. She got another opinion, told her the same thing. She said, I'm not really convinced. And this patient now, I see her sporadically, has not been treated for four years where you can barely feel the mess now on no treatment. So you think it actually shrunk? It shrunk. It absolutely shrunk. Wow. On no treatment. I don't know how to explain that, but she was willing to wait. The mess wasn't really huge, a three centimeter, and she bet on this improving, and it honestly shrunk. It absolutely shrunk. See, I love the waterfall plot of the placebo arm of the serafinib trial. It was a pretty good waterfall plot, but it was a placebo. What about, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about desmoid tumor, what it is, and also this fascinating observation of spontaneous tumor regression. So there are two kinds of desmoid tumors. The first one has a beta-catenin mutation. The other is in a are driven by APC mutations, same pathway. One comes with a risk for familial adenomatous polyposis, uh, which you, if you have an abdominal desmoid, is really the thing you have to worry about as a medical oncologist. But most of these are beta-catenin mutations, and it's, it's a fibrotic tumor, and it's not going to spread. And it's the first tumor for which I recommend that people remember the first principle of medicine, which is first do no harm. This is uh, a tumor that has been classically uh, overtreated. And, you know, one of the most interesting events of my life was when, you know, full disclosure, I was in that trial too. You know, we had about 20 patients with desmoid in this trial. And when they unblinded it, the initial reaction was that there was something wrong <laughs> with the investigators. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you know, because you had, uh, you know, smaller desmoids and was this just investigator measurement fall, you know, and w w what was going on? How do you have a 20% spontaneous regression rate to placebo? You know, this is a tumor with a true spontaneous regression rate. And, you know, if you go back, and I, I do think it's interesting, you start going back and looking at the older trials and a lot of things like tamoxifen with Cylindic had a 20% response rate and have since been removed from the guidelines uh, because we were doing no better than thinking we were, we were helping people uh, by waiting for their spontaneous regression rate and making them menopausal. But, you know, this gets into a really complicated space now. And so, you know, there were three papers that came out in CCR uh, that I had the privilege of editing all at the same time. You know, one of them is a grunchy natural history study where they just watch desmoids in Europe to see what happens and even growing desmoids. You know, and then one was a bunch of mutational analyses looking at, 
you know, do these mutations predict for response? And then finally, there was a, 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 a group of common investigators, you know, uh, that looked at what was the response rate to the drugs we were using that were already in the guidelines. And if you take these three things together, what you see is, you know, plus this response rate happens, that we're over-treating, and that, you know, this led to the new guidelines, uh, which are, you know, all does my patients should be presented at a multidisciplinary tumor board with a radiation doctor, a medical oncologist, and a surgeon, so they can basically all keep each other from doing anything unless there's a real reason. You know, <laughs> if they hurt, there's a real reason. If they are impinging on structures, there's a real reason. And there are legitimate treatments right now, and most of them are oral. And, you know, that gets into what do you do first, and it's hard. But also, I've watched these things melt in front of my eyes, and nothing happens fast in Desmoid, which is actually the hardest part about being the medical oncologist, which is informing the patient. Nothing happens fast in, in Desmoid because, they, you know, you, though you want it to spontaneously go away and it has a good chance of doing it eventually, it may not be on your, 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 your time scale. So any hypotheses? I mean, immunologic, like what's going on? Why do you see this? We, you know, it, there's got to be something within this immunologic recognition of it eventually, right? You're, you're clearing it. It's not like it just gets smaller and stops and you're left with a core that grows back. You clear it. And so the body at some point decides it's foreign. But, you know, they're clean. Their tumor mutation burden is low. And so eventually having an activated beta catenin pathway may not be a good thing to your immune system. Now I'm nervous that you're going to tell me this next case we presented was actually spontaneous regression. But before we get to that, maybe you can help a patient. 39-year-old woman, Daniel in the chat room has. 39-year-old woman with recurrent abdominal desmoid tumor, now with unresectable 11-centimeter mesenteric mass. Failed tamoxifen, imatinib, and most recently serafinib. Any suggestions on subsequent therapies? So it, it, this sounds like a patient with uh, familial adenomatous polyposis. And so there is uh, data for the and probably appropriate use of uh, doxel or vimblastin with methotrexate uh, in this patient population. Or as uh, the data, as the approval will run through for neurogastat, that would also be a another line of therapy. But the, the APC-FAP patients are the ones where the, I really see a, a really nice activity of doxel. Well, so as we're going to talk about, you would think the neurogastat would be a lot more tolerable. But let me listen. Let me let you listen to this next case, and then we'll talk about what we know about uh, this incredible trial, the Defy study, which incidentally really was a, a, a advocacy group, a desmoid uh, tumor advocacy group, really pushed and was a big part of making it happen. So really incredible story. But anyhow, this is a 19-year-old woman unresectable, symptomatic, 14 centimeter desmoid tumor uh, who gets serafinib but can't tolerate it. Here's Dr. Hussein. She's a 19 year old. CT scan showed a huge tumor around 14 centimeter. This is really a thin girl. And the biopsy showed desmoid. Our colleagues in pediatric him onc started her on serafinib but she really couldn't tolerate the drug very well. And then I saw her with her mother around nine months ago. She was symptomatic. I repeated the MRI of the pelvis and it showed the tumor to be really large with the pressing on the nerve, clearly no role for surgery. But I was able to convince her to stay on one tablet of sorafenib, but I added Sulindac, which is the anti-inflammatory. And it's amazing, it's three months ago, after six months on the treatment, I repeated the MRI. You really see some shrinkage and some necrosis in the tumor. And she's really doing well on Cylindac and Serapinib. She's actually up north in New York in college now and doing well. This patient really pushed me about surgery. And I know there isn't really but in a young patient like that. And if she continues to respond, and even with the new agent, the neurogastat, is there a role now to reconsider 
surgery or localized radiation or cyber night, because these patients don't like the fact, and I understand that they are going to have this disease the rest of their life. Any other questions? What would be the role of neurogastet, which is the gamma secretase inhibitor in this patient if and when he progresses? And what experience do you have using this agent? And what are the most common side effects that can be encountered? So don't tell me that this was a spontaneous regression. It could be. That's the problem, right? <laughs> you know, I, 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 nothing happens in desmoid quick. And, you know, is cylindric actually, does it actually matter? And we, I don't feel like I know. But also, did it matter? It could have. We don't have a really good answer here. There's no randomized data, but we took tamoxifen out of guidelines, right? And cylindric was only there with tamoxifen. And so then the question is, she stayed on the first dose reduction from the Alliance trial of serafinib. So she was on a therapeutic dose of serafinib for desmoid. And at that dose reduction, where a small 19-year-old girl may have just the serafinib alone. Uh, you know, and so, you know, the hardest part about treating desmoid is that, you know, people have iPhones, they press a button, they get an instantaneous response, right? You hit the button, you wait a year in desmoid for it usually to do something. And so, you know, that makes us hard. And so it could be a spontaneous regression. And now we think that, you know, the addition of uh, serafinib with cylindic is active, right? This is what happened the entire time before we had the, the Gounder data for Desmoid. And so this is where, you know, you are all, everybody's N of one. If you get back into the original data, everybody N of one or one or two or three, which is where the, you know, tamoxifen data came from, uh, where we see these complete remissions. And, you know, that's the, one of the most interesting things, uh, I think, you know, I heard was the if and when. It is an if. If it responds, it may not come back. And so, you know, the first thing I would do if it responds is put her back on something tolerable. Because, uh, you know, I've been pulsing patients and so far, you know, I haven't seen a lot of resistance. Because, uh, you know, I still have patients I'm treating from the original Alliance trial that came off trial, but then some of their tumors grew back, so I retreated them because they didn't actually go away. Neurogastat in a 19-year-old female is going to be complex. Uh, Neurogastat comes with one side effect that I think we as a medical oncology uh, act, uh, group in an AYA setting have to be aware of, which it can cause ovarian failure. And the full data is not out to which to make the statement of whether or not it will actually be reversible. It looks like it's reversible, but we don't have the full data set from the trial. And so then you have to counsel a 19 or now 20 year old about whether or not she wants to risk ovarian failure or just go back on serafinib. And I, I think this is a complicated patient partner decision uh, that, you know, is going to be a whole bunch of new, uh, or it's going to be a, a new area for patients to have to make really complicated decisions, especially if they're young women. So we'll get into a little bit more in the granularity of what we see with Neurogostat. Uh, but as long as you, we brought up this issue of uh, tolerability, the other thing I think that's been observed is hypophosphatemia. You don't see that too often in oncology, erdofitinib and uh, bladder cancer is one that comes to mind. Uh, is that a clinical issue? Do you have to change your diet, et cetera? I just repleted a couple of the of the patients. I, I think it's something that can be dealt with just with phosphate supplementation if needed. I, I didn't see a lot of clinical symptoms from it, but we did we did we did follow it because they were on trial. How would you compare quality of life? I mean, you have the issue about ovarian that you brought up, but in, in terms of quality of life and sort of day to day type side effects, how would you compare neurogastat to serafinib? So if, if I left ovarian failure off the, or on the table and just said, you know, I think neurogastat is probably better tolerated than serafinib, but I think there are a lot more medical oncologists that are comfortable using serafinib. And so as this FDA approval moves through, I, I think that it's going to come down to a newer agent uh, with some, some risks versus an old agent. And the good news is that uh, one does not necessarily preclude the other one from working. And so... You know, I think that it's more a uh, an issue of what other alternatives are viable 
I, I'm not a great fan of radiation and say young people because of the risk of radiation induced sarcomas later. But, you know, these ablative techniques have also been shown to, you know, there's data coming out from Stanford looking at like HIFU with Desmoid and there's a response rate there. Uh, and so there are other ways of actually treating these that aren't necessarily completely surgical, but they're also probably stimulating the immune system to clear these. This is the advocacy group, the uh, Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation, that really pushed to get this DeFi study done. What an incredible story. Can you talk a little bit more about the biology of desmoid tumors and sort of, I, I've seen it, I don't know, can, you know, described as kind of maybe related to wound healing biologically, like, and also how uh, drugs like Neurogastat work? So... You know, the Wnt pathway, you know, goes through a protein called beta catenin, and this is involved in turning on and off signaling. And gamma secretase is involved in cleaving and activating this Wnt signaling pathway. And so by inhibiting that, you can kind of shut down this mutation that shows up within desmoids that says grow. And so because of that, you know, it's really an elegantly developed therapy, right? You're actually going after the biology of the tumor uh, by basically shutting it down its natural biology. And there's not a lot of other, you know, uh, except apparently within ovarian development, a lot of other really big wind pathways out, you know, active outside of development. And so because of that now, you're, you're finding like a nice place for actually putting a therapy. So here's where the presidential presentation landed in the New England Journal. Uh, you can see pretty big uh, separation there with a hazard rate of 0.29. Uh, uh, really mm -hmm. impressive. Looks like um, all the subgroups uh, benefited. Waterfall plot, really impressive. I think even more than just even the response rate. Um, and here's the, uh, the, uh, the spider plot duration of exposure. Again, really impressive. Uh, the, one of the things I love the most about the paper and about the study, a lot of the patient reported outcome stuff I can't really figure out or identify with, but this you can see black and white, pain, other things, you know, very big difference in what the, they were able to document uh, objectively. I thought that was uh, really awesome. We talked about hypophosphatemia. You mentioned the ovarian dysfunction that at this point looks like it's going to be reversible, but as you say, I think we need more time. This is being reviewed by the FDA, and uh, we'll know this summer. It seems like it would be a great tool to have. What about using agents like this for neoadjuvant therapy? You know, Dr. Hussein brought up the anguish this young woman is going through because she can't have the tumor resected. Are there situations whereby using systemic ther therapy you can convert the patient to resectability? Problems with desmoid tumors is that you the concept of negative margins isn't there because this is an infiltrative fibrotic process, and so uh, you end up with a you know a fifty percent recurrence rate with surgery alone, uh, suggesting that performing an oncologic surgery is difficult. Not that it hasn't been tried for generations, but it is difficult, and it's known that really it's a debulking surgery, right? And so. If you can get the, but I mean, if you go back to those waterfall plots, though, you know, at, at some point, are these completely gone or is it a lifelong problem? And, and I think that you have to wait and figure out in an individual patient because, you know, uh, when they go away, they really, really go away. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is a difference between having, you know, an underlying FAP associated desmoid. These are more aggressive. But, you know, this is a disease with morbidity without a real mortality rate. And so you have to approach it as such because otherwise, you know, you can drive a mortality rate from our treatments. And so, you know, this is the one tumor where you have to sit back and figure out what is the least amount of harm you can do to the patient. Uh, because you can probably do worse things to them over treating desmoids than just waiting for its natural history to play out. So I want to see if we can get through some uh, cases here. We'll have a lot of great cases. I'm just going to ask you briefly about the issue of uh, targeted therapy. It doesn't look like there are many targets that you're hitting right now, but uh, one that's kind of interesting is NTREC. It is a 
even though sarcomas are very uncommon, it actually is a pretty common cause of NTRK fusion. I don't know, and we have two drugs that I think everybody knows, uh, pan tumor approval, uh, both entrectinib and larotrectinib. Have you uh, taken care of patients with sarcoma and NTREC? Do you have any preferences uh, between these two uh, NTREC inhibitors? So, you know, we screen, at Washington University in St. Louis, we screen every patient that's metastatic for NTREC fusions that are appropriate. Uh, and so, you know, everything is, every patient gets tampa sequencing. And, you know, over the course of the last, oh, I don't know, seven years, I have found two NTREC cases. <laughs> and so it, it is very, very rare. But if you're that patient, it's really important not to miss this, right? And so from that standpoint, you know, uh, larotrectinib is usually our, our first go-to with entrectinib right behind it. And then we actually have some other phase ones of some different entrect inhibitors as a, uh, the next line. Uh, but, you know, this is important to find because, you know, the, the, these are wonderful drugs in terms of toxicity and, and quality of life. And if they work for a very long time or, you know, if you really get into pediatric infantile fibrosarcoma, that is the actual therapy of choice because it works amazing because it's driven by uh, an NTREC translocation. So we actually have embedded in our pediatric population an actual NTREC driven sarcoma. Uh, why the preference for larotrectinib? I, I was going to say because you have more experience with it, but I wouldn't <laughs> think it would be that with two cases. Oh, uh, well, I think it's just, uh, it may just be a bias with all watching all the trial data come out when it did. Uh, and it's whatever I can actually get paid for by insurance. I, I don't think there's a great, I don't have a great bias either way. All right, let's see how we can get through a few of these cases. Uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas has a, we were talking about the fact that the presentation before yours at ASCA is on angiosarcoma. She's got a patient with angiosarcoma of the breast. Uh, when she originally saw the patient, the question came up of whether or not uh, she should get adjuvant therapy. She decided not to get adjuvant therapy. Unfortunately, this patient recurred and actually uh, had a pretty dramatic complication of metastatic disease. Here's Dr. Thomas. Two years later, then was found to have this small 1.5 centimeter left pleural base nodule. She underwent lung wedge resection consistent with recurrent angiosarcoma of the breast started last summer on doxorubicin. Shortly after this, and this is quite remarkable, developed kind of gross bright red blood per rectum, emergently transferred from our local community up to the university and required an IR embolization to control the bleeding. So she underwent emergent sigmoidectomy and had basically a four centimeter angiosarcoma, so essentially an implant in the rectum thought to be metastatic focus from her original tumor, now has led to very diffuse disease. Now, remarkably, she's in great shape. She has widely metastatic disease, but probably because she's young, is clinically in great shape. So she actually has been seen at another institution for this trial of oleculumab plus dervalumab. So a couple of questions that I would ask is, would a specialist have recommended any kind of adjuvant therapy after that initial 1.9 centimeter angiosarcoma in the breast? And then just interestingly is the widespread metastasis, do we think that that's just the natural history of this disease since it had gone to the sigmoid colon? Or maybe was this rupture and bleeding event of the implant kind of the trigger to that? Any thoughts? Well, there's a lot there. And so, you know, angiosarcoma is a very complicated disease. And I wish Dr. Thomas was here so I could ask her a few more questions. So first, there are two kinds of angiosarcoma of the breast. There's a radiation-induced angiosarcoma of when you have breast cancer early and then five to 20 years later you get. And then there's a primary breast angiosarcoma, which often has PI3 kinase mutations. It's kind of interesting. You start to see the same mutations in a primary angiosarcoma of breast that you do in breast cancer. My clinical experience, and I actually, unlike, you know, uh, my NTREC patients, I, I see quite a lot of angiosarcoma. You know, we see about one new patient a week here. And wow. my preference is actually neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I think our outcomes are better. This is a weird disease uh, because it is a muscle cell that's from the lining of a blood vessel. 
uh, they can form these attached microsatellites up to 10 or 20 centimeters away uh, from the primary tumor that's still attached. And the second you operate, you free them. And so when we get a primary angiosarcoma, we start with neoadjuvant chemo and then radiation and the mastectomy. And we're following these patients out. And, you know, we know that surgery alone is probably not curative. Surgery with radiation seems to not get ahead of it. But we seem to have, been, by throwing in taxanes early, seem to see a very different outcome. And, you know, where you get past CRs, and this is something that we're just kind of evolved over the last 10 years. And so we would actually push for more of a neoadjuvant approach. There's a, a paper coming out from the Mayo Experience and CCR about this. And so I think it's kind of a different perspective where, you know, multidisciplinary management prior to surgery for angiosarcoma really does need to be involved in these cases. With 300 cases a year in the country, there aren't that many centers of expertise in angiosarcoma. So this is the right, uh, this is the right tumor to travel for. And, you know, but and this also has a very strong patient advocacy organization, just like the Desmond Tumor Foundation that helps to get patients to the three or four centers that see a high volume of this. Uh, what about this issue? You know, I, I didn't mention that after she had this uh, urgent uh, bleeding event, she blew up with lung mets, and she was wondering, you know, where they connected. Do you, do you see this in particular, angiosarcoma, uh, you know, rupture, dissemination, et cetera? The overall survival and clinical trial for angiosarcoma in the metastatic setting is under nine months. <laughs> and that's uh, at the bottom of the curve when you hit zero. <laughs> I mean, it is a very sharp curve of a, a group of patients that uh, traditionally do not do very well. And so when this disease, you can actually watch it spread like lymphoma in front of you. And you can watch it just crawl up a chest overnight. And so this is a very aggressive disease when it decides to grow. And so to see a patient explode like that with angiosarcoma is not completely unexpected. Whether she had, you know, seeding and distamination, which is possible, it still had to grow in the lungs. And this is what this disease does, which is why getting ahead of it as fast as possible in the, in the you know, you know the upfront, uh, the setting and being aggressive as possible is your only opportunity to get ahead of it. So a uh, question from Dr. Thomas about supportive care. And we get so focused on new agents that, you know, we maybe don't talk about supportive care as much as we should. Should Here's Dr. Thomas's question to you. The other thing for this group of patients that supportive care is really, really important. It is for all the patients, but particularly for this group. They often need really good pain management Actually, I would love to ask them, so many patients who have these musculoskeletal involvement, we often are definitely challenged by when you max out their oral narcotics. And is there any role for some of the pain pump implants or regional blocks? We definitely see patients who are really plagued by local regional pain that the narcotics are often inadequate for. So do they have any good suggestions for more local regional procedures or infusions, something like that? So one of the blessings of working at Washington University in St. Louis is I have some of the most talented interventional radiologists that I get to partner with for the treatment of pain. And so I'm really big on blocks. Uh, I am really big on ablations, you know. I, I uh, can't say I've ever had a pain pump placed in my career because I haven't had a pain that was that unmanaged. Uh, I, I think that, you know, there are a lot of ways to manage uh, rotations of narcotics. And, you know, don't forget about steroids with bone pain. Uh, you know, I think one of the hardest things to treat in the AYA population is a young boy with bone mats everywhere. And it turns out steroids work wonderfully. And so I think that partnership between, you know, uh, supportive care and then a medical oncologist that really understands the disease is really needed. And then access to talented interventionalists makes it, well, it's one of the reasons I don't leave where I work, uh, just because I, they're amazing. All right, let's do another case. So this is from Dr. Hussein, 35-year-old man with a 5.5 centimeter leiomyosarcoma. This is a 35-year-old man 
one of the nicest people you will encounter who works in a restaurant. And over a period of a um, few weeks, his co-workers told him, you are limping. And he said, no, I am not. I'm just too tired. And to make the long story short, he ended up palpating himself, actually, a right thigh mess. And a scan showed a solid mass of 5.5 centimeter. And at that time, he had a biopsy and that showed leiomyosarcoma. And he had surgery in June of 2022. The unique thing about this sarcoma, that the surgeon who did the surgery resected a few lymph nodes from the right inguinal area because it was very close. Usually, we don't stage sarcomas with lymph nodes. They usually spread hematogenously. And one of the nodes was positive. Now, what I didn't know, Neil, that one positive node in sarcoma makes it stage four. This is the new staging. My question to the faculty is, why is one lymph node involvement in sarcoma makes it stage four? So, a lot to unpack there. You know, the first question is, uh, lymph node positive sarcoma is melanoma until proven otherwise. So is the pathology, right? Uh, there are sarcomas that uh, traditionally spread the lymph nodes, epithelioid sarcomas with the rhabdos, occasionally synovial. Uh, Lyomyosarcoma going to the lymph node is highly unusual. And I think that's why in the both classic and current guidelines, that's disease that has spread. And, you know, the, 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 this disease where, you know, you haven't just resected it, radiated it, and you're done. That's this disease that has spread. And this has unusual biology for lyomyosarcoma. And so, you know, is the pathology right? Has the pathology been reviewed? And at this point, I, I think this is, you know, if you've cleared, this is a patient where you begin a discussion of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, to try to uh, get ahead of this. And so, you know, and that's a complicated, that's a complicated area. Uh, but, you know, this is a disease that spreads hematogenously. And so if you think about it like a carcinoma, uh, you can get yourself into trouble. I was asking Dr. Bowie, what's a question I could ask that would cause a lot of fighting and arguing? And he said, ask about adjuvant chemotherapy <laughs> after lyomysarcoma. But anyhow, I want you to see the follow-up here in this next uh, comment. I treated the patient aggressively. I gave the patient three cycles of doxorivacin, epasomide, mesna, adjuvantly, adjuvantly, because I knew this is a bad actor. Then we gave him radiation therapy. Then we gave him three additional cycles of doxorivacin. Therefore, there is nothing we didn't give this guy. In March, a month ago, he presented with shortness of breath. And he was found to have a huge right pleural effusion, multiple lung nodules. We admitted him six, seven weeks ago. I gave him one cycle of gemcitabine and docetaxel around a week or two ago, and unfortunately, he is progressive. My question, what else can I do for this 34-year-old man who next is really palliative care, young with two young kids? Is there any study, any new treatments I can offer this guy? Clearly, he is not responding to chemotherapy. I was watching your face as he described that, and I, I know that you've seen this so many times, so tragic. Any thoughts? Well, first he answered his own question to why one lymph node is why we consider it stage four disease. Right. And then second, I would really, really like to know, see, if with one lymph node positive, I would have done the same thing. He did exactly the right thing, but I would have sent sequencing off at that time because I know what's coming, right? And the question is, is there something special about his lyomyosarcoma or is this just a P53 RBATRX driven process? There are multiple phase three clinical trials in the United States going on right now for lyomyosarcoma. Uh, the, you know, the first one is actually a trial of the carbazine with an espelin. It does come, you know, you get the carbazine either way and you know, it's, it's a placebo controlled trial, but you know, that's open now. Uh, unfortunately, as Gemtax, but the next trial that's opening is a gemcitabine docetaxel and arginine deaminase trial that's opening as a national phase three. Uh, you know, does he have part biology? Does he have homologous recombination? You know, at this younger age, you know, is there a uh, is there an underlying predisposition? Uh, 
you know, there's a lot here, but there's a lot of trials going on. And leiomyosarcoma is one of the most sought after histologies. And so I think going to, uh, going for a, a second opinion for trial, which is highly appropriate because, you know, Dr. Hussein is highly competent, but I think going for an uh, opinion to see what access to trials is this man's next step. As long as he's, you know, uh, fit. All right, let's see if we can just squeeze one more case in here. A 53-year-old woman of Dr. Patient of Dr. Thomas. Here's the case. This is kind of a great example of what we see out in the community. So 2016, incidental finding after imaging for a motor vehicle accident showing a very small left renal cell carcinoma. So she'd undergone radical nephrectomy for that. And then we were following her for iron deficiency anemia. As part of the evaluation for anemia, we had a GI evaluation done, which showed a polyp, which appeared to be just kind of a routine colon polyp. And so it was snared. And then the pathology on it was of a GI stromal tumor, very low grade, low mitotic ratio, less than five per millimeter squared. The recommendation was surveillance with either sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, which we're doing. So my question to the specialist is, would they recommend a more extensive surgery, an actual sigmoid resection versus just a polypectomy? And then the question of recommending adjuvant imatinib, it doesn't really meet criteria for that, but it would be interesting to get their input on that. So right now she's just in surveillance. Any thoughts? So that working backwards, I think that this patient does not meet any criteria for adjuvant therapy. Uh, you know, it would be interesting to know what the genetics are and to know if there's, say, an underlying NF1 mutation in this patient, uh, cause they occasionally get these low grade gists. Uh, you know, I think that the risk benefit conversation of having surgical removal needs to be had with a surgeon and, and the, the patient partnership and making that clinical decision needs to be made. Uh, you know, but uh, as, uh, You'll see, I think, uh, this is the lucky patient where this was found incidentally and that uh, surveillance is appropriate. So, uh, Brian, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, audience, thank you for attending. If you're a nurse, uh, coming back on Thursday, we're going to talk about uh, urothelia bladder cancer. If you have nurses uh, that in your practice, uh, let them know about this uh, program. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Brian. Well, thank you for having me.